I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, Ukraine evacuates part of Kharkiv Oblast ahead of a feared Russian assault. Russia declares a state of emergency in Voronezh, and Zelensky makes his case to a packed Congress hall at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 16th of January, one year and 326 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, and Brussels correspondent, Joe Barnes. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. So let's start inside Russia. A state of emergency has been declared in the city of Voronezh. This is about 200 k's northeast-ish of, of Kharkiv. This was after Ukraine reportedly launched an overnight uh, drone attack that damaged several buildings. Major Vadim Kstetin said that some residents had been evacuated from their homes after debris sparked small fires and windows were shattered, adding... They introduced a state of emergency in the city, or sorry, the introduced state of emergency in the city will allow for a prompt implementation of measures to replace them. I don't know if he means the windows there. Anyway, the governor of the region, Alexander Gusev, said um, a child was injured when a drone debris fell on her apartment building. Russia's defence ministry said it had destroyed five drones and intercepted three others overnight in the region and intercepted a further four in the uh, neighbouring uh, Belgorod Oblast. So Voronezh, city of about a million people. It's got a, an airbase or nearby airbase where the Sukhoi Su-34s are based. Russia often uses those, the fighter bombers, to launch airstrikes on, on Ukraine. No immediate comment from Ukraine. Kiev has intensified, we think, its air attacks in recent months. Says it's uh, targeting Russian military infrastructure to undermine uh, Russia's war efforts. Then in uh, Ukraine, across the country, Russian strikes overnight uh, resulted in civilian casualties, deaths and uh, and injuries, reported in Mykolaiv, Herzon, Zaporizhia, Oblasts. Um, Just breaking the last hour or so, Ukrainian authorities in Kharkiv have ordered a mandatory evacuation of several thousand people, citing worsening Russian attacks in that area. Um, so Oleg Sigbunov, who's the uh, Haiki regional governor, said, given the security situation, we are introducing mandatory evacuation of the population from the Kindrasivska and Kulivska communities of Kupiansk district. This is going to affect about 28 villages, we think, over about, over 3,000 people, about almost 300 children. I mean, this, is, this has happened before. They've done it before and from this same area as a precautionary measure. Um, Joe, I'd be interested in your thoughts a little bit later. I don't like doing the kind of, ooh, what what could happen? This could happen, that could happen. I mean, anything could happen. But there have been um, mounting concerns or increasing concerns that, uh, that, the, that the northeast might be Russia's uh, um, next avenue to try to, to push against Ukraine. But I'll come to you uh, well after me. I'll be interested in your thoughts on that. Now, separately, a bit more on the on the destroyed plane that we talked about yesterday. So the A-50 it's referred to as a spy plane, airborne command and control, however you want to refer to it, that was shot down by Ukraine on Sunday. Karolo Badanov, who's Ukraine's head of military intelligence, he said that it, it was the, the shoot down on Sunday it exploded midair. He t- he's been speaking to the Financial Times. He also said that the Aleutian, the IL-22, was badly damaged but limped to a Russian airbase at Anapa. That's on Russia's Black Sea coast. Badanov said the A-50 was shot down. It exploded. The IL-22 was badly damaged damaged but unfortunately for us it managed to make an emergency landing in Anapa. that as i say it's inside russia about 50 k southeast of the kirsch bridge now interestingly russian commentators speaking about the a50 largely denied that that ukrainian forces had brought it down but instead went for this strange claim that the aircraft was destroyed by friendly fire from russian air defense which you know question 
question for a for a long evening which is better to say that it's um that you lost something because of enemy competence or your own incompetence but anyway it doesn't necessarily matter but it's just an interesting view on it so Bedanov said there are he, well he said there are just eight A50s in good condition. We were talking about this yesterday. We thought there were from reports last year. We thought there may have been about five or six. Bedanov saying eight. I mean, you know, we're not exactly sure, but it gives you the ballpark figure of how many of these things there are, and there ain't many. Now then, Colonel Yuri Inyat, who's the Ukraine's Air, uh, Air Force spokesman, he was commenting on a photograph that shows a very heavily damaged the sort of tail of the IL-22, an air base. He, um, he wrote on Facebook, he said, the target is destroyed, resuscitation will not help. It certainly looks like it will take, you know, it's not just going to be, the, the panel's just not going to be beaten out. I mean, it's, it's, there's a big old mess there. He said, the long-range radar detection aircraft A-50 was and is a priority target for us. And until today, the destruction of this aircraft seemed an impossible task for the Air Force. And then the IL-22 was also targeted, two fat targets at once. Now then, Justin Bronk, we've had him on the pod, beefy brain box from Rusi, senior research fellow for air power and technology. He was he uh, on Twitter. He's also commented about that photograph. You, you'll find it of the tail fin that's very, very heavily peppered. He said, if this is indeed damage from the same engagement as the reported A-50U shoot down, I've not heard of an A-50U, I don't know what variant that is, but he means the A-50, the A-50U shoot down. It supports the theory that Patriot Pac-2 Gem was the weapon used, since it has a large blast fragmentation warhead that could produce a pattern consistent with this damage. So Pac-2 Gem, when you see that, Patriot Advanced Capability Mark II, pack that's the pack bit and then the gem is guidance enhanced missile so that's an improved warhead and missile acquisition and tracking system over the original patriot system built by raytheon into service about 20 years ago maximum speed three and a half thousand miles an hour operates from around 10 uh, 10 feet to 100,000 feet in altitude range of 100 k's so a very very capable air defense missile next Colonel General Alexander Sersky, who's Ukraine's second most senior army commander, has said his country's aim is to exhaust Russia as it adopts, as this is Ukraine, has adopt, adopted a, a defensive entrenched posture over the winter. General Sersky said his armed forces are now engaged in what he described as active defence. All, all defence has to have an offensive element to it. You can't just sit and hide and hope no one comes at you. You've got to go out and keep punching. So an active defence does have a, a uh, hopefully mobile, but certainly a very active and offensive spirited element to it. So he said Ukraine's armed forces now engage in active defence centred on smaller counterattacks. He was speaking to Reuters. He said, our goals remain unchanged, holding our positions, exhausting the enemy by inflicting maximum losses, offensives at the level of a battalion are a major rarity so a battalion for ease of maths 500 people depending on the role and all that kind of stuff and attrition and so on and so forth but you know underneath a battalion is made up of a number of companies of about 100 120 people and those companies are made up of three or four platoons of about 30 so battalion is is um usually commanded by or well, depending on the nationality in, in Britain, we command it with a lieutenant colonel, but it can be commanded by a major. But, you know, it's a sort of it's the medium sized building block, if you like, of, of a military force. Three or four battalions make up a brigade, three or four brigades make up a, a division and, and so on. So battalion, quite quite a big old thing. So Sersky saying offensives at the level of battalion are a major rarity chimes, I think, with what we've seen in recent months that both sides are um, are very tired and in need of recuperation, certainly over the winter. Now, that's reflected in today's British Ministry of Defence intelligence update, which says there's been no recent shift in the front lines. They're saying that after Russia took the town of Marinka in late December, that's about 10 k's west on the main road out of Donetsk City, after Russia took that it was thought they might try and keep some kind of momentum going to continue to push along the road to the west to look at the settlements of Karakove, it's about another 10 k's away, or turn south to Nova Mikhailovka. But neither's happened. They are exhausted. They've got no further than Marinka. British MOD Defence uh, Intelligence Update says further says that the encirclement of, of Avdivka remains Russia's priority. Notwithstanding what I'm about to ask Joe about the um, the what might or may may not be shaping up in the northeast, but British defence intelligence saying Avdivka remains Russia's priority, but very little movement has taken place there. What there has has come at great cost. 
and the town of Stepove, which is slightly to the northwest, seen as the kind of gateway to Avdivka. That's certainly where the logistic resupply route runs in to Avdivka. That remains firmly in Ukrainian hands. British Defence Intelligence also say that Ukrainian Marines are still able to hold their positions on the left bank of the Dnipro, the the east bank on the sort of the side held by Russia. That's down south opposite Herzog. And just finally, uh, we mentioned him yesterday, Vadim Skibitsky, General Skibitsky, Ukraine's Deputy Military Intelligence Chief. He's also been commenting, saying that Russia's ability to produce missiles and drones is being hampered by international sanctions. So General Skibitsky said Russian forces had not included KH-101 or Caliber cruise missiles in these waves of strikes that we've been seeing since mid-September last year, likely as part of an effort to build up a, a large missile reserve. He said that Russia's defence industrial base is is thought to be able to produce about, well, he's saying 130 missiles suitable for st- strategic strikes against Ukraine each month. But that the actual monthly production output varies because the KH-47 Kinzhal ballistic missile and KH-101 and calibre cruise missiles require many foreign con- uh, components that are blocked by sanctions. He says that Russia is unable to produce analogues of these foreign components domestically. Now, he further said Russian forces have recently started launching Shahid drones against frontline areas. And that's a break with the recent experience. You know, they have been launching these drones or most things at Ukrainian infrastructure, trying to hit the energy grid, trying to shatter the civilian morale. They've now seemed to have shifted, certainly with the Shahids, which are basically low, slow and noisy compared to the the other missiles at their disposal. And the Shahids are largely being brought down by small arms fire and systems such as the German Gepard, twin barrel, 25 mil, huge rate of fire, shoving shoving bullets in the air to hit these things. So Shahids coming down as they are attacking areas with high air defence concentration. Therefore, they are shifting, Russia seems to be shifting the use of Shahids to the front line because you can't cover everywhere with air defence all the time. So Shahid's now being used increasingly at the at the front line. That's reflected by Ukrainian forces saying they've intercepted a lower number of drones, Shahid's, since late December. These um, uh, these uh, figures from the ISW, Institute for the Study of War, they make that point that it's likely due to the lower levels of Ukrainian air defence coverage at the front line or not optimised for use in those areas, very vulnerable. So Skibitsi said the weapons that Russia is using, in particular the Kinzals, are very inaccurate and unfortunately it is mainly civilians who suffer from them. So a bit of a download there, I'm afraid, David, but I would be interested in um, if you're able to, to squeeze him in for his bit, Joe's thoughts on what may or may not be shaping up around uh, the Kharkiv area. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Dom. It's a lot of the talk. We always have Difka is the big sort of area of focus that everyone looks at and sees. You see the most sort of videos posted on social media of columns of armoured vehicles, Russian tanks, etc., basically going into an artillery barrage as they try and break through the Ukrainian lines there. But what we have had slowly is over the last few weeks, this idea and this theory, expectation that the Kharkiv region is going to become a new sort of, not front entirely, because it's, it's still rumbling on this. So Kupiansk is a big location. Russia at least by all accounts taking heavy losses there, but he's putting a lot of resources into it. On this axis, or I guess an axis of line, basically it runs from Kremina stepped over and then up to Kupiansk from basically the, across the Luhansk border with the Kharkiv region. So a few weeks ago, we published a story that I wrote about how Ukrainians in Kharkiv, uh, so people with links to the military, etc., had recorded a series of pre-attack bombardments that had been carried out as part of like Russia's long-range um, campaign. They basically, while yes, they've hit Two hotels, the Kharkiv Palace and the. Um, sorry, the other one slips my mind. Um, they're used by journalists and foreign aid workers, etc. They've also been hitting a hell of a lot of military sites in and around the Kharkiv region. At one point, it was muted as January 15 for a possible start date, but things have slight, slightly slipped by all accounts. But it hasn't stopped changing. And there is the more and more. So we were talking about Belgorod being hit again today. The more and more 
Belgorod is hit by Ukrainian drones and various long-range missiles, that only increases the pressure on the Kremlin from these sort of pro-war, ultra-nationalist war blogger communities, military blogger communities, to basically create what is known as a buffer zone. And so again, uh, uh, when was this? I wrote this six days ago that Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman, said Russian forces would do, and I quote with like bunny fingers, everything to prevent further Ukrainian bombardment of the Belgorod region. And basically then his comments were like jumped on by these sort of war bloggers, Russian pro-Kremlin war bloggers, suggesting that there had to be a large-scale offensive to advance at least 15 kilometres, nine miles, into the Kharkiv region, basically to push... Ukrainian artillery and multiple launch rocket systems out of range of Belgorod. So Belgorod's about 20 miles inside Russia. But yeah, so that's that's interesting to know. I was speaking to, speaking to someone in Kharkiv this morning. It's a place I've spent a fair amount of time in since the war has broken out. And they're, they're basically saying the same. They're saying, look, entirely all the talk and expectation is looking at a Russian offensive in the Kharkiv region. Look, it's not to be confused with them trying to take the city again. They failed to take Kharkiv city. Uh, on the first day of the war, and they've never held it. They've just basically used it, bombarded it with long-range missiles since. Um, so, again, like Ukrainian forces in the area, they're braced for some sort of large-scale missile, long-range strike, and an offensive to start before February. So it's hard to it's it's really hard to tell what's happening um, as all of these things, the fog of war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Kupiansky's being hit isw call it sort of positional jostling um looking for favor we don't know is it is it it's a potentially is it probing or are they just getting smashed entirely over there there are some other things to look at though so you you then like you look around the border and you go could be Ansk, possibly a weak point but it's hard work for the russians there you would expect the ukrainians to have really fortified the border of Kharkiv and russia it's just natural when you're next door to a you're the aggressor who's trying to invade and wipe you out. But then if you skirt round further sort of to the north and you've got the, the gap between the Kharkiv and Sumi region borders, and there seems to be a lot of action around there. I think the Ukrainian military noted there was around a hundred long range shellings, whether it be sort of grad missiles, one five five, one two two or whatever munitions. So it's really impossible possible to like sort of tell what the Russians are planning, but there does seem to be an uptick of activity, and I think it's the pressure on the Kremlin, which will then filter down to the Russian Ministry of Defence, from these ultra-nationalist war bloggers. The fact that, and this is one thing that Vladimir Putin has always wanted to resist, and the Ukrainians have been trying to do, is to basically bring and take the war to Russia to make people actually understand Russia, inside Russia that this thing is going on. Is So, yeah, that's it's, it's a big pressure on the Kremlin to do something, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Dom and Joe, for all of that. That was really fascinating. One quick question for Dom, I think, and then we'll go back to Joe for some of the diplomatic and political updates. From everything you and Joe are saying, what I can't tell really is who do we think maybe has the initiative in this? Is it the Kremlin being pushed to do something? Is it? Is it? I mean, what what do you think? What is, or, or is that still quite unclear, Dom? Who, who's leading on this? Yeah, I don't think I don't think either side has a, has the initiative at the moment, and I think the initiative is not on the battlefield right now i think that you know the start of the 20 of 2024 we've seen what's happened over the last couple of years i think both sides now realize that this is a long endeavor and need to dig into and re- replenish and build in many places that defense industrial base so i think if you're looking for signs of initiative and, and who's got the momentum i think it's going to come from there it's going to come from which side is able to build up that core support in the not only in society, but in defence industrial base and, and in politics more broadly. And again, I don't think either side has a particular advantage there. Russia is very is, is very much hampered by its inability to access the open market. We've seen that today in the, in the reports I was talking about there, the components for the more sophisticated sort of high precision missiles. Hence, they're going to the likes of North Korea for artillery shells and that always hasn't hasn't always worked out well the quality control there is not is not brilliant we've seen a number of barrels that have just just absolute they've they've the munition has gone off in the barrel for various reasons so that the that's not ideal they turn to iran as well they're still trying to look to china to weigh in although china's massively lukewarm in its support i think so not not great in terms of defense industrial base of course there's 
as a firm political support in Russia. We wouldn't know otherwise right up to the point it shatters. But I don't think I don't think it's a particularly healthy place there. Ukraine, I mean, there's a number of countries are, are starting to move back in. BAE Systems have, have opened an office. That's good. But an office is not a factory. And so a few, a few arms manufacturers have moved in. A few countries have pledged support and increased production lines in, in, in a certain number of areas. But there's been no considered long term you know if you if you were going to build something for 10 years what would you what how would you start today it, it's all still a little bit piecemeal all good every little bit helps but there's there's no kind of overall plan there maybe people are dragging their feet waiting to see what happens with the US elections maybe people are seeing how how much the EU really are up for this with kind of you know Hungary holding up the um the purse strings there so I'm not entirely sure but but I don't I don't see a lot of initiative or, or much initiative anywhere at all and uh, but I don't think it I don't think it would be evidence on the front line at the moment. The one caveat I'd put on that is that um, Ukraine still does seem to be able to innovate and and come up with or be able to implement plans that might be might be quite narrow in scope, but deep. They work. So, for example, what am I talking about? I'm talking about this this ambush, if you like, of the A50 and the IL-22. I'm talking about these long range strikes, the um, uh, we think storm shadow strikes against submarines and navy black sea fleet vessels in Sevastopol and 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 elsewhere and further east around uh, around Crimea. I mean these things don't just happen because someone sees a sees a blip on a radar screen and thinks hey let's launch at that and see what see what we hit. I mean these are very well planned, well executed. Like I say I use the ter- use the term ambush. They are they are going for a specific target at a specific time and place and they've they've worked. Now we don't know how many of these others that they've attempted that have not worked. I note the Kirsch Bridge is still standing, but they have worked in some areas and these are signature pieces of equipment that are being written down. Very very important electronic warfare assets, naval assets, air assets, all the rest of it. So if there's any sign of initiative anywhere and momentum, I would say it's in one very small area, uh, and that and that is in the ability to plan complex, long-range, precise strikes, and that I think sits with Ukraine. What Russia is doing is still going for the for mass, still going for just trying to inch forward at the cost of of huge number of lives and very expensive equipment, as in expensive as it might be signature equipment or it's. It's in short supply, as the tanks and the armoured fighting vehicles now are. So Russia isn't displaying any real initiative on the battlefield. And there's that one small area where I think Ukraine might. But I think slim pickings overall, both sides now kind of sitting back and thinking, right, what are we doing here? What, what's the what's the way forward? What's our priority for 2024, maybe even for 2025 as well? And how are we going to start building towards that? Thank you very much for that Dom. Joe, let's come to you then, and we can talk a little bit about momentum and initiative. Talk us through some of the political and diplomatic updates we should be aware of. Yes, um, let's start with President Vladimir Zelensky in Davos um, at the World Economic Forum, somewhere you know quite well, David, from your previous history, from what I gather. So he has made his first sort of in-person appearance at what is billed as the sort of meeting in the Swiss Alps of the global elites, financiers of the world, etc. And he's basically seeking to shore up support for Ukraine as the uh, conflict comes up to its its second year. So he first started the morning. He met with Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General. And Jens Stoltenberg had this to say, great to start the day in Davos by meeting President Zelensky. Despite a serious battlefield situation, there is cause for optimism. Ukraine retains its independence. Ukrainians have rejected Russia and chosen the West. And Ukraine is closer to NATO than ever before. What President Zelensky is looking to do, he's, I think he's met Blinken and the Secretary of State of the United States. He's met Jake Sullivan in that meeting. He's Joe Biden's uh, national security advisor. So I think Zelensky is due to speak about now in Davos, so maybe in the my final thoughts I'll try and get some of these live comments for you. Jake Sullivan speaking later, Ursula von der Leyen spoke earlier, etc., basically saying that Ukraine needs more support. But So it looks like Zelensky's focus is mainly on his 10-point peace plan. So what's important was uh, there was a meeting of national security advisors on the well, it was probably the day before Davos officially started, but Andrei Yermak... Um, Zelensky's chief of staff basically chaired that and I think there was 
There's about 83 people involved, which is more than met in Malta to discuss Ukraine's peace plan. And just a little bit on what the peace plan is, because we often speak about it, but maybe not reiterate what Ukraine is asking for. So basically, Ukraine is asking for the full Russian withdrawal from all Ukrainian territory. That includes Crimea, payment of reparations, uh, the prosecution of war crimes, amongst other things. And there's also lots of steps on Ukrainian nuclear sites, ensuring grain exports, exchanging prisoners of war and future security, etc., etc. But yeah, so Zelensky is desperately trying to push this. He's not trying to push a negotiation because is Vladimir Putin going to negotiate on the terms that Zelensky wants? Absolutely not. And is Zelensky going to negotiate on Putin's points? Absolutely not. But it also gives... What's also interesting is it also gives Zelensky a chance to like meet the CEOs of all of the top banking executives um, and other various companies all gather around the ski resort every year to discuss the world, basically. And it goes back to what Dom's saying. He was saying about BA Systems promising a factory or some sort of setup. We know there's American firms. I've spoken to Ukrainians that are at a very senior level in the government apparatus, and they're basically saying, look, we're really trying to get international arms companies to set up inside Ukraine. For one, it helps us sustain our war against Russia. But two, then it can help us rebuild the economy after, after the, the war ends, uh, because everyone is going to be in need of replenishing their stockpiles so why not set up new production lines in ukraine to help give ukrainians jobs help bring in tax receipts etc etc yeah it's interesting there so let's look out for davos and i'll come back when there are some updates on president Zelensky's speech let's go to farming so the farming ministers of poland hungary slovakia romania and bulgaria have all penned a letter to the european commission to basically demand tariffs be imposed on ukrainian grain so the EU has a system in place where exports from Ukraine come in ta- into the EU tariff and quota free. So it basically means Ukrainian exporters don't have to pay taxes on these exports. But the countries, the farming ministers from these countries who all border Ukraine have basically complained that when grain comes into Europe, it basically then ends up sitting in their markets because it's it, grain's expensive to, to move on. So that's why the Black Sea is so important. It's actually a relatively cheap way of transporting grain compared to loading it onto lorries. So basically, this grain is what they say all gets dumped in their countries and ruins their domestic market. Basically, the grain from Ukraine is cheaper than their domestic markets. So lo- domestic farmers are being hit by this. So the minister said... Their uh, countries have su- suffered significant damages since the European Union suspended these quotas and duties on grain imported into the EU last year. The letter reads, This is why Brussels needs to introduce measures that protect the market of member states bordering Ukraine while helping them use make use of their full export potential. One of these could be introducing import duties on the most sensitive agricultural products. So previously, arrangements have been made for these countries that border Ukraine basically... Ukraine would be allowed to export grain into the EU, but basically it wouldn't be allowed to stay in, say, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria. It would have to be moved on, and the EU made a load of money available to basically do to do that, but it, it hasn't seemingly worked to date, so there's still lots of complaints there. But some better news. So Polish truckers who have been blockading some of the border crossings with Ukraine since November have reached an agreement on certain conditions with the government and they will suspend their protest on Wednesday. So tomorrow, that's about 11 a.m. GMT, midday in Europe, according to the organisers. So basically, again, Polish truck drivers have been demanding that the EU reinstate a system whereby Ukrainian companies need permits to operate in the bloc and the same for European truckers entering Ukraine. Basically, again, part of the generous package of support for Ukraine and its financial well-being was suspending these licenses that truckers need to enter the block from Ukraine and basically Polish truck drivers are saying that once the Ukrainian drivers are in they then will might they might drop off something in Poland but then pick up another job and they are essentially cheaper than local truckers And they're saying that basically they're being undercut by Ukrainian truck drivers who can then drive, pick up a job in Poland and then drive all the way to France 
to drop something off and then drive back and carry out other jobs while they're in the EU. So Tomasz Bukowski, who is from the Committee to Protect Transporters and Transport Employees, has said it won't be the end, but there will be a suspension of the protest. We agreed certain conditions. We will give the government time to work as it is a new government. Some news on Ukraine's trade deficit. So Ukraine has posted a trade deficit of $24.35 billion in the first 11 months of 2023. That's according to Ukraine's statistics service. Export of goods totaled a grand total of $32 billion. Yeah, 32.8 no sorry 98 billion from january to november while imports reached 57.33 billion in that same period so yeah it's um they're not exporting as much as i'd like to that's because uh, largely the black sea while it is getting sort of millions of tons of gr- grain out it's still partially blockaded that is still one of the areas that ukraine is seeking to improve and i'm sure it would do and let's look to a, another interview by Dmitro Kaleba. He's the Ukrainian foreign minister. And he has said there have been times when he felt the urge to, and I quote, punch in the face his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. In the, and he was basically referring to the talks that happened during the early stages of Moscow's invasion. So Kaleba's brief remarks were part of an hour-long informal interview with a Ukrainian video blogger focusing on topics ranging from cooking to hobbies to Ukrainian football. But as I say, when asked a series of rapid-fire questions about his most difficult set of negotiations, this is what Mr. Kleber had to say. The most difficult talks are those in which you feel simply that you want to go and punch your opposite number in the nose, but you really can't do that. And I can say that this occurred two or three times. One occasion was with Lavrov, and that, that was when they held um, talks in Antalya, in Turkey, in the spring of 20, 2022. And it's basically part of a series of Russian and Ukrainian negotiators meeting for several rounds of talks in the early weeks after the initial evasion, first near Ukraine's border with Belarus and later in Turkey. And Mr. Kleber said at the time the talks in Turkey had been difficult and dealt with a ceasefire and arranging humanitarian corridors. No, arra- no agreement was made in those talks and there was basically not been any negotiations since. And it's, it's something that you, you actually hear a lot from Ukrainians. You speak about doing diplomacy and I, I was speaking to a, a senior minister fairly recently about doing business with their Hungarian counterparts. And they were essentially, how said, how do we do business with the Hungarians when we know their leader is happily shaking the hand of Vladimir Putin? So I can imagine it's entirely difficult when you've got the government of one of, of a country trying to like kill your citizens, kill, take your country, topple your government. But you still have to have some diplomacy with them. Uh, yeah, so very difficult. And yeah, shall I stop there, David? That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Joe. <clears throat> As you said, the, the Zelensky is speaking now at the World Economic Forum. So I haven't got the, I don't know what he's saying because I haven't got the audio on, but I'm sure some updates will be coming through on the Telegraph's live blog. It's quite something, yeah, to see the, the Congress Hall fill up. It looks absolutely full and you can see world leaders sitting in the, all, all along the, 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 f- the first row taking, taking pictures. And he's currently, I think, having a chat with Borger Brenda, the, the uh, president of the World Economic, uh, world Economic Forum, not the founder, that's, of course, Klaus Schwab. We'll certainly, I think, Joe, if you want to have a quick look at what's coming through there, that'd be wonderful. And we'll have a proper download, I think, tomorrow, once we've seen what he said and seen how that's gone down, about what uh, Zelensky said and how and and what impact that's had. He's certainly been very, very busy. I think this is the first time he's come to Davos. He, he, um, during the full-scale invasion, he called in the previous years. It was stayed in Ukraine, but he is there now in in this Swiss mountain town. Dom, can I come to you then first, while Joe just picks up some things from the WEF? Dom, would you like to share your final thoughts? Yes, thanks, David. I'm actually quite tempted to ask you for your thoughts on Davos. You used to used to work there, Davos Knowles, as I think maybe we should call you. So I'd be really interested in your views on actually how much work gets done here. Is it just for show? How much work happens in the background? Does anything ever come of it? But I will let you ponder on that. And if you want to opine, then please feel free. My final thought, which links to what Joe was saying earlier on, is about it's about Davos. And he mentioned that President Zelensky's met, met Ursula von der Leyen. I'm glad he stopped there, Joe, that is, because he was in danger of stealing my sandwiches. They've just been slightly nibbled. But I was going to say, or I am going to say, Ursula von der Leyen has said that Ukraine's allies need to have a conversation about guaranteeing stable backing 
for for Kyiv. She said, quote, Ukrainians need predictable financing throughout 2024 and beyond. They need a sufficient and sustained supply of weapons to defend Ukraine and regain its rightful territory. So this absolutely in line with what we were saying yesterday, the, the Estonian plan of if NATO members gave a quarter of 1% of GDP, that would produce 120 billion euros a year. And even if the US pulled out of that, then the European members of NATO would provide 60 billion. So that's the kind of thing that could happen. I hope that's the sort of plan that Ursula von der Leyen is talking about. It certainly would be the place to do it, I would imagine, David, you'd know better than me. But I think that's probably the place where these kind of ideas could be circulated. Thank you on the subject. Thank you to Stephen, who suggested that we all have a look at or just Google 0.25% Ukraine petition. There is a petition in the UK, which if it gets enough enough votes, I think it's 100,000, is it? People have to sign up to it or submit it. That It's then discussed in Parliament. So to get this on the political agenda, just to throw it around see and, and see if it works. But I hope these conversations are happening right now in Davos. And I do think it's, it's worth, worth having a look at that, at that website for a petition. So, David, over to you. Yeah, well, of course, this isn't the first time I've done this, is it? Because we've been running this podcast for nearly two years now. And Davos has happened during that time. So I've, I know I've sort of given my, my, my very briefly my brief background. I'm not pretending to be sort of globetrotting Davos man at all. I was a social video editor at the World Economic Forum for about three and a half years before I came to the Telegraph. So I lived in Geneva and of course, well, yeah, went to Davos and worked with the brilliant comms team there um, every year. It's really, really tricky to talk about the influence and to how to think about it. What I would say is kind of, Don, what you said earlier, that one of the big strengths of the place is that everybody's there. So in about, if you go, if you go to Davos, within two days and you're a business leader, say, you will meet pretty much everybody you need to meet. You can pack in what would have been otherwise months of, of business meetings traveling around the world. You can pack it all in, in in about two days, three days in the Swiss mountain town. If you're a world leader, if you're Zelensky, you can meet everybody you need to meet. You can meet them, you know, the manufacturers, the businesses, the heads of state. So as an efficient way of doing kind of global business, it's very, very good. And you can see why he's going there. Like everybody will want to meet him. Everybody will want those bilaterals. Um, Everybody will want to be, you know, and, and remember, so you've got this sort of the public meeting in the Congress Hall, and it's the thing I'm looking at at the moment, the, the stream, which is streamed live to the public. But then behind that, you've got um, one-on-one meetings, one -on -one meetings with heads of state. You've got uh, private closed-door meetings where the press aren't allowed in, and all that kind of stuff it is really important because that's often where the business gets done. I mean, you know, look, I'm as I said, I wasn't particularly high in the food chain at the World Economic Forum at all. This is just my impressions. And I'm sure I wonder whether I'll get a slightly annoyed email from some colleagues and messages that this isn't really how it works. This is just my two cents from seeing it, doing it for three years. So, I mean, another another thing to, to, to mention, which of course is important, and this is what Peskov said the other day, right, is that Russia is not there. Peskov said, no, none of this means anything. It won't matter. It doesn't matter because we're not part of the conversations. And in a way, he has a point, right? In another way, it's very, very important that the fact that they're excluded means that Zelensky can talk to his allies. He can shore up support. He can work out what they can give him. He can put pressure on people who may be wavering. He can press the flesh. He can go around the room. And he's doing that all without the adversary, the, the adversary there, which is very important. And when we're thinking about things like sort of the unity of the West, or the unity of the allies, that kind of thing, th this kind of event is, it, it is very important in that. It's also, I mean, I, again, I've said this in the past, but it's worth reiterating. The forum, which is kind of what, you, what you call it if you're in it, the forum, the WEF, whatever you call it. I'm wondering how to put this diplomatically. It's always interesting to see the issues on which it takes a stand and which it which it will sort of studiously avoid. And the fact that you know Russia is not invited to Davos, the forum is very openly is, is openly interviewing Zelensky and saying, you know, you're, you're doing a really good job. We're with you. That's important and that's interesting because they don't do that for everything, right? And it's interesting to see which issues they do choose and which issues they don't choose for whatever reasons. But so I would say from a WEF perspective, it's interesting that they've clearly chosen a side. It's got huge convening power and linking up power from heads of states to businesses to social enterprises, all that kind of thing. So it's worth looking. And actually, the, the fact that it's just Ukraine there is, is important in its own right. So it's a bit of a rambly answer. I hope that's useful. But do go to the WEF's website, weforum.org. They've got all the events and all these the videos and things there. And Zelensky is talking at the moment. So we'll have to come back tomorrow and just sort of think about what, what that is. Is there, anything, is there anything else I can help with on this? No, that was great. I was just chatting with Joe there in the background on our messaging, asking what the best canopy you, you had, which I think was an equally insightful question and one which we demand oh to Lord. know the truth. Um, 
I mean, I was working about from about 7 a.m. to like 10 at night. I don't think we had time for canopies. I remember there was what we weren't as staff. We're not allowed to go to the parties. So and I very dutifully and responsibly didn't. So I, I don't have much insight, sadly, into the um, in, in, into the sort of the, the after hours stuff, sadly. Um, but it's yeah, it's a very interesting place. Yeah. Um, so I hope that's useful, Dom. Joe, you've been, I think, following what Zelensky has been saying in real time. Um, can you update us? Oh, yes. Let me uh, try and update you to the best because I've, um, without wanting to interrupt and my listening to your insights um, and what's going on, I've not been able to flick onto the actual speech, but I'm trying to follow on Twitter and that is full of Russian bots as well. But I've managed to prize a few insights for what's being said. So Zelensky has told the WEF, the World Economic Forum, Davos, whatever we want to call it, every reduction in pressure on Russia adds a year of war. So basically, if the West stop putting pressure on Russia, it's just going to make this carry on. He's warning that Putin will not change, and he's saying the West must change. And then basically the entitled, and not sorry, not entitled, the usual warning, sorry. If anyone thinks this war in Ukraine is only about Ukraine, they are fundamentally wrong. He's basically, Zelensky is saying that, look, if you think Putin is going to stop here, then you're wrong. So a little bit more. So he is saying that Russian President Vladimir Putin is going to pursue his invasion of Ukraine, even if fighting pauses on the sprawling front. After 20, This is Zelensky, and I quote, After 2014, there were attempts to freeze the war in Donbass. There were very influential guarantors, the Chancellor of Germany, the President of France, he's talking about the Minsk Agreement, I'll go back to Zelensky, but Putin is a predator who is not satisfied with frozen products. So he's basically saying that, look, if you allow this war to freeze over, then it's going to it's going to come back. Don't allow this to happen. Flicking over to a Twitter, short Twitter thread by Faisal Islam, the BBC's economy editor, who is also in Davos, and he is tweeting that Zelensky tells Davos there are big questions the world has asked about when the war will end and whether there will be World War Three. Zelensky says Ukraine has was repeatedly held back by the message, don't escalate. Then he's Zelensky goes on to say, how can sanctions not block Russia misobjection? That's a complaint about all the loopholes that is allowing Russia to get hold of Western components, dual use equipment uh, to build and replenish its missile supplies, even though there are swathes and swathes of Western sanctions in it. And this is a quote. We need to dispel the notion that global unity is weaker than one man's hatred. Zelensky warns, yeah, as I said, Western leaders will not attempt should not attempt to freeze the conflict and then Zelensky concludes that this war will end with a just and stable peace so yeah lots lots of uh, jumping around there but I, I'm going to go away and scroll back on any YouTube feeds or whatever and try and watch it in full now but um, yeah one anecdote that I was once told from Davos though is a, a journalist a friend of mine who has covered it many times he never once actually entered the any of the um, the venues he just used to sit on the bus all day which basically takes you from the ski sort of the resort where people will stay or the hotels or the chalets that people rent out at extortionate costs up until the event and he basically used to then strike up conversation on the 15 20 minutes it takes for that journey with various people and he said that was the best way to get hold of influential people rather than going through their offices it's just basically when you're forced onto these small buses um, you might get sat next to me interesting insight there but i will stop there david thank you Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, a world affairs newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine The Latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And, if you have a moment, leave a review, as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter, 
you can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Charles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells. <laughs>